please rise. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our sermon text for this morning is taken from Romans chapter 8 beginning in verse 18. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. We pray. These are your words, Heavenly Father. Sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. In the name of Jesus Christ, your fellow redeemed. Again, we are continuing our series in Paul's letter to the Roman Christians. And in this particular text for this morning, we have a very fascinating text because it gives to us some very unique explanations or answers to a very important question. Namely, why is this world in which we live so frustrating? But I would like to begin with this question here. Is this world in which we live becoming a better place? Well, we might say yes when we look at advances in science and in medicine and technology and communications and standard of living and travel, communication, and some would say a number of other areas as well. But what about in other areas, especially human relations. How about war? How about preventing human disasters? What about poverty? Well, the fact is this. Throughout the history of the world, right up until today, we have nonstop poverty, suffering, disease, injuries, aging, war, rebellion, holocaust, tyranny, terrorism, perversion, crime, family breakdown, injustice, slavery, false religions and teachers, famines, hurricanes, tornadoes, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and the list could go on and on. And it's interesting that all of these, if you look at the history of the world, all of these at least take place at the same level as they always have. And some of them have actually increased. And of course, then there's still death, and you know, we've been able to postpone death now by 20 or 30 years compared to a generation or two ago. But you know, death is still there. We haven't come close, never will come close to eradicating it. And so the world really isn't any better, never will be. You have pockets, though, where things have gotten better. You have pockets, certain places, certain times where maybe there has been an increase in civil rights and, and how we treat our neighbor, but they're just pockets that last for a time in certain locations. Just pockets. Scripture tells us two things tells us and predicts that knowledge will increase, and thus we see what we see in technology and science and so forth. But the Bible also tells us that the world is fallen and always 
will be fallen. It will not, in any real, meaningful sense, get better. If anything, it will get worse. And our text says it quite well. That creation has been subjected to frustration. That creation is in bondage to decay. And thus creation is in a state of, of groaning. And you know why? God did it. That's what our text says. God subjected the world to frustration. We might ask, well, why in the world would an all-merciful, an all-powerful God do this? And we actually have two answers, two very unique explanations that you don't find anywhere else. Okay? Number one, Genesis chapter 3. The fall. The fall into sin. God told Adam and Eve that there would be consequences for them rejecting him as God. There would be consequences for them saying, we're going to go and trust with Satan, and not you, God, because he has said if we go with him, we, be we can become like you. We can become like God. And so we, when we look at the details of Genesis 3, it's quite interesting. Uh, first of all, God said the consequence would be death. Eternal death and physical death, obviously. Uh, but not only physical and eternal death, but everything associated with death, everything that contributes to or points to or leads to death, such as aging and sickness, accidents. So raise your hand if you know of any country in the world that doesn't need doctors and medicine and hospitals and clinics. They don't exist. Why? Because of the fall. The fall. You know, young people, we notice that at about the age 12, 13, 14, they, they start getting quicker and faster than their parents. They are able all of a sudden to play sports better than we are. You know, baseball or basketball or soccer or karate or whatever it might be. Why? Because of this aging process that is set in way back at the time of the fall. Consequence of the fall. Um, you young people just have to remember, however, that you know, you're going to catch up to as well. And you're going to start that aging process sooner than you think. So, death and everything associated with death. But if we look at Genesis 3, we see some other things too that are a consequence of the fall. God said to Eve, what? That she would have pain in her childbirth. And he also said to her that she would now have a damaged or an imperfect or corrupted or less than ideal relationship with her husband. In other words, what was affected by the fall was the family relationship. Again, raise your hand if you have a perfect or even close to perfect relationship with your spouse. Raise your hand if you have a perfect or close relationship with your children or your parents. You know, it doesn't happen. It's not going to happen in this life. Except my children would raise their hand, but they're not here today to contradict me. <clears throat> uh, but one of the things to notice about this, this corruption that has entered into the family relationship is it, it has a trickle-down effect. It not only affects husband, wife, parents, children, but it also affects all other relationships that kind of extend from the family. And so we see this happening throughout the world in all facets of life. You know, what, what nation do we know that doesn't have prisons? How well has uh, the war on poverty that began in 1964 worked? Not very well, if at all. You know, raise your hand if you, if you live in a city without crime. And you might be thinking, well, I'm just talking about those extreme cases. Uh, most people get along just fine. Most relationships are, are working out quite well. 
Well, why is that? Well, let me give you one reason why that is. Let's suppose we did away with government. We did away with the courts. We did away with judges. We did away with mayors and legislators and governors and presidents. We, we did away with the police. What do you think would happen in our relationships with other people, even within our own neighborhood? It'd probably be quite a bit different. In other words, God has given us the blessing of government in order to help keep relationships civil among you human beings. And without government, it would be drastically different. Or think of it this way. What would our relationship be like with other nations if we didn't have government and armed forces? You know, we're having trouble right now with our border in Mexico with government. Imagine if we didn't have government at all and, and all the things that would happen and could happen. In other words, again, God has given us the blessing of government to keep in check our sinful nature so that we can live somewhat civilly with one another in this life. So, again, the fall says that our relationship with others, starting with the family, will be negatively affected. affected. They, they won't be what they, they should be. But back to Genesis now, Genesis 3. God also said something to Adam. He said, because you have rejected me, the ground is now cursed. And so he, he would have trouble just putting food on the table for family. It wouldn't be the joy, there'd be sweat. In other words... One of the consequences of the fall is that nature was affected. Our relationship with nature is affected. And so what do we have? We have, again, tsunamis and earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes and famines. And this is why you spend uh, two months out of the year in your home during the summer, at least I do for the present time. Uh, it's why we pray for rain because the fall has had a negative impact on our relationship with nature. This is the way God set it up for now. And so not only is our relationship with God affected by the fall so that we now have death and disease and aging, but also our relationship with other human beings. So they, they are corrupted. They're not as ideal as they should be. And not only is our relationship with God affected and our neighbor affected, so is our relationship with nature affected. In other words, as our text says, creation has been subjected to frustration. Creation is in bondage to decay so that it groans. It is not what it, was, what it was meant to be. And neither are we. You and I also groan because we live in this world and we live with this sinful nature. Now, I don't want you to misapply what I'm saying here, so let me clarify something. I'm not saying that we shouldn't seek to make life and the world better for ourselves in our neighbors, we should. And that's what Christian love is all about, seeking to help out our neighbor in various ways. Uh, not only those personally connected to us at home or in the church, but in our neighborhood, in our city, in our state, in our country. You know, we seek to do these things. That's what we are here to do. But the point is, we will never come close to an ideal world. We'll never come close to a utopia. We'll never have a heaven on earth. It will always be subjected to frustration, to decay. And it's not pleasant. It's rather painful. But, there's another message here, another explanation as to why this creation and we are groaning. I want you to listen again to the words of our text. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope 
that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So, the groaning of creation and the groaning of us, first of all, points back to the fall. Keeping in mind that as it points back to the fall, this groaning therefore also points to our hearts because you know, we're, we're just as sinful as Adam and Eve. We have the same sinful nature. We know less than they do. But St. Paul is also saying that the frustration, the groaning, is not only pointing back to the fall and to our sinful hearts, but this frustration, this groaning, is also pointing ahead to the future, both for creation and for the believer in Christ. St. Paul says it's like the pains of childbirth. Childbirth, so I am told, is quite difficult and and rough and and horrible. But childbirth and the pains are are pointing ahead to something that will make our sufferings seem like nothing compared to the wonder and to the glory that is coming. Our present groaning, and the creation's present groaning, is a reminder of hope a hope. And remember that the Christian understanding of hope in the Bible is not simply a wish. But the Christian understanding of hope is a confident expectation. It's a sure hope. It's saying, this will take place. This will happen. You know, I feel this pain right now. It's terrible. I don't like it. But it tells me, it tells me that something wonderful is about to occur. In the case of a woman, a childbirth, a child is going to be born. In the case of the present creation, this present earth, a new one, a new heaven, and a new earth is coming. One that will no longer groan because it will no longer be subjected to frustration and no longer in bondage to decay. And in the case of the Christian, our hope, our confident expectation is what? A perfect, redeemed body. An immortal body. A glorious body. Like that of Jesus. You know, our our marriages here are not perfect. But if they last, if we survive them, they, they are something we cherish because God blesses us through them. And we have our imperfect and sometimes rebellious children, but we would die for them. And they bring us not only heartache, but also great joy. And we sometimes experience the devastation of nature, but when we look at nature, we also see at the same time that it was the handiwork of an awesome creator. It's the only way it can be explained. And we have the great state of Texas, which seems almost as hot as, you know, but it's also our dear home, or becoming our our dear home. And we have these uh, bodies that are aging and wearing out and decaying, but at the same time we acknowledge that they are fearfully and wonderfully made. So the things in this life, like marriage and family and work and government and nature and our bodies, are far from perfect. But they do, they do reflect something that is perfect, something that is to come. 
something that will be. For the Christian, the imperfect here is really a taste of the perfect to come, even though now we have to suffer and groan with them. It's kind of like God is teasing us a little bit, saying, here, I'm going to give you a little taste of something. It's imperfect. It's not always ideal. It kind of can be suffering, but it's a little taste of what is to come. It's partial now. It's imperfect now, now, but it's not the final story. So, the groaning of both creation and the Christian point back to the fall. And therefore they also point to the sinful heart. We are broken. The groaning that we now experience both in creation and within ourselves is a reminder that we're sinners. Broken. The groaning reminds me that I can't hold up anything before God and say, look at this God. Look how I've done this or that. It's really good, God. Look, God, how I've met your requirements. Look, God, you're going to declare me righteous. You're going to declare me justified, aren't you? And God says, no. I cannot justify myself before God. I cannot justify myself in any way. But as St. Paul explains over and over again, in the book of Romans there is somebody who will justify me and you and does there is one who justifies those who believe in Jesus as St. Paul says toward the end of this chapter 8 which we'll look at in detail next Sunday He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. We cannot justify ourselves by our own effort. But God justifies us. He says to us poor, groaning sinners living in a decaying, frustrating, and and groaning world, I declare you righteous. I declare you justified. I declare you forgiven. And he does so because he puts up on the cross in our place the only one who could say, I met the requirements. He puts up there his only begotten son, the innocent for the guilty, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he can declare the guilty righteous. And this people, this is the only reason we have hope, a sure hope, a confident expectation in the midst of a lot of hard times, in the midst of a lot of misery, in the midst of groaning. You know, this, is, this is why we have a sure hope that this world, after it is destroyed, will be a new heaven and a new earth, never to groan again. And this is why, brothers and sisters, that, to use the words of Job, after my skin has been destroyed in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own newly created eyes. I and not another. And we will have a body no longer in bondage, no longer in decay, no longer subjected to frustration, no longer groaning, no longer partial, no longer imperfect, no longer temporary, but a perfect one, 
an immortal one, a glorious one, a one, one that lasts to eternity. So again, we conclude with the words of St. Paul from the beginning of our text. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Amen. Please rise. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forevermore. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen.